I'm Paul Baxton now and welcome to the first of what will be a weekly blog post. Now you can either read them at my website paulbaxtonnell.com or you can listen to me read them out here on YouTube on my YouTube channel. So here we go, blog post number one. A stoic quote for you. I can't call a person a hard worker just because I hear they read and write, even if working at it all night. Until I know what a person is working for, I can't deem them industrious. I can if the end they work for is their own ruling principle, having it be and remain in constant harmony with nature. Epictetus discourses. Heavy duty training, a philosophical approach to bodybuilding from the depths of Temple Gym, 1993. Let me take you back to an autumn day in 1993. I had just competed at my very first nationals and I've been training frequently at Temple Gym in Birmingham, where I'd been asked by Dorian Yates to join him and Kenny Brown to begin training together, either when Dorian needed an extra training partner or when Kenny wasn't available to train with him. If you know anything about heavy duty training, you'll know that Mike Mensah was one of the originators of the style. Now, not only was Mike a phenomenal bodybuilder, he was also a great thinker and philosopher. Now, Dorian had trained with Mike the year before and he had taken out of elements of his own heavy duty style and refined them even further to create one that created one of the world's most awe-inspiring changes in physiques between his 1992 and 1993 Olympia victories as documented in the series of legendary black and white photos in Flex magazine. It's certainly no coincidence that after training for over 40 years and and then attaining honours degrees in history and literature, that I began to find within the greatest stories and tales certain elements within mythology that appeared perfect analogies to actual situations in my bodybuilding career. And that would also be perfect advice for anyone in any situation in life where they found themselves up against the task that appeared at first too great to take on the quest on this first week's post i'll give you just one example of where a morning in temple gym birmingham would later provide the exact same metaphor as a legend in greek mythology it sounds strange well let me take you back to that clear autumn morning around 10 20 a.m standing outside the doors of Temple Gym waiting for Dorian and Kenny to arrive. This tale in its entirety was a quest, a journey to seek the bodybuilding equivalent of the Golden Fleece or of facing the Minotaur. My quest was to build the biggest, freakiest, best shaped muscle laden physique of all time. In reality, the quest was no different than those of antiquity. It was just the prize was a different one. To achieve this, I had already undergone my apprenticeship, years of training. I had years of training under my belt with the biggest guys at the gym until I was the biggest guy at the gym. And then I had to look around and I found a great mentor in Johnny Fuller, the legendary ex-Olympian contender. He trained with the very best, including Arnold. Johnny's high rep, high volume approach gave me results, but the style of training didn't really suit me or my physique. I just wasn't recovering enough. So I searched for the best, and the best was Mr. Olympia, and he was in England, Dorian Yates. So I traveled to Birmingham three times a week to train at Temple, hoping that one day he would invite me for a session. And that's exactly what happened in that autumn of 93. Those of you who have ever had the privilege of ever training or visiting the original Temple Gym in Birmingham will know that it is underground, underneath a shop, 
As I look back, I can't help but see the symbolism associated with the journey to Hades or the underworld of Greek mythology, where the hero would have to battle immense danger, whether it was the Minotaur, a dragon, Medusa, or some type of dangerous beast, and that danger was very real. As I walked down the 30 or so steps into the dark, dingy blackness, it was a literal representation of a trip to the underworld, one where I was very much going to meet danger and battle something that could literally kill me if I messed up. The weights were very heavy and very real. The descent into the underworld. We descended in darkness because we were the first ones in the gym. Temple Gym opened up back, there, back in those days to the public at 12 midday to ensure that when Dorian and I or anyone who else he trained with, we had no distractions. Every piece of equipment was free and ready for our use and no one was there to watch us train. He himself was known as the Shadow, a very mysterious character in bodybuilding appearing once each year to dominate the Olympia and then return to his lair only to get bigger and freakier the ne next year. Well, it was around 10.25 when he arrived and we acknowledged each other with a simple nod of the head, no words were spoken, and then only the bare minimum of words were ever spoken during the workout, simply what weights we were using and the encouragement during the set. The time for talking would be afterwards, when we had finished, survived, and then we could relax and sit and chat. But until then, it was all work, it was war. End of. Dorian would get the cassette tape ready, <laughs> back in those days, yeah, cassette tape, for the workout. And then we would all begin stretching and warming up, with four or five minutes on an old fold-up stationary bike, the only piece of cardio in Temple Jing back then. Only when we were fully warmed up and ready would Dorian press play and the workout began to the first chords of Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses. Leg Day was always the album Appetite for the Destruction by Guns N' Roses. And that music would sear a neurological connection into my brain so strong that even today when I hear those first few chords to Welcome to the Jungle my stomach tightens, my brain clears, and my body, without a doubt, undergoes some type of endocrine adjustment, <laughs> probably a rise in testosterone. As my brain equates the song still to preparing the body to go to war for a workout to hell. Well, Dorian would grab a bottle of water from the fridge and we would walk over to the leg extension to go through our first two warm-up sets before doing our one all-out set to failure. Experience is time's true master, as when you choose your warm-up weight, you had to ensure that it was heavy enough to prepare the quads for the huge amount of weight that was expected in the working set, but not enough that it took any away any energy or strength from that working set. Those two sets breezed through, but my legs were already fully pumped and full of blood as we ensured we squeezed the muscle to the maximum at the top of each rep. We each rotated turns until it was time for our one working set each. This was an all out maximum effort with as much weight as we could possibly handle with perfect form for between eight and 12, even going up to 15 reps, if it was possible. The set was brutal full-on effort giving everything our bodies had in them and squeezing hard at the top of every rep encouraging each other to keep going giving assistance when needed to eke out another one two even three more reps until our quads were fully exhausted and gave up well that was just our first exercise and we were only maybe six or seven minutes in into the workout and i was already walking unsteadily with a fierce pump in the quads when we walked over to the Smith's machine for one warm up, followed again by one all out set to failure. The warm up set was hard and heavy, heavy enough to prepare the quads for the intensity of the weight of the working set. 
but not enough to take away from the set to come. Metaphorically, I was now in the battle with the dragon. We had traded blows in that first exercise, but now things were getting serious, deadly serious, as the weights involved were enough to break tendons, muscle fibers, and leave someone crippled. So with full focus and determination, we prepared ourselves for that final working set. Now on the wall, next to that Smith's machine back then at, T at Temple Gym, was a list of all the names of the people who had successfully completed 10 reps with perfect form, with five plates aside. The stands had to be close, heels almost touching, feet 10 to 10 past the hour, and arse to grass right to the bottom and back up again for 10 complete reps. Now there were some big guys training at Temple back then, some huge guys. And we had many top pros from around the world come and train. I myself was a 310 pound top national competi competitive bodybuilder who Dorian must have thought maybe had the mental and physical attributes to train with him. And yet, there was only one name on that list on the wall. Yeah, Dorian Yates. I could only ever manage four plates aside for eight to 12 reps. And Kenny also went with four plates aside. Dorian was superhuman strong as strong a bodybuilder as anyone I've ever met. And I've met pretty much them all from way back then. Maybe not as strong as Ronnie, but their form was completely different. Dorian's form was precise and perfect, insanely intensely executed, whereas Ronnie's form was always a little looser, but he lifted much heavier weights for sure. So into the set we went. When you unrack the Smith's machine, the huge weight hit you. You were gonna squat this weight under control until your hamstrings touch your calves and then explode upwards again until you were just short of lockout. So the tension was still on your quads. Each rep felt like it was your last possible rep, but on you went. Your quads on fire, shaking, feeling like they will give way any second. But then you feel yakes behind you and you know you're never gonna let yourself down with Mr. Olympia behind you. Not a chance on earth. He never gave much verbal encouragement, neither did he need any himself. Entirely self-motivated. He needed you there to help load the weights and give him that minute touch to give him the extra one or two false reps he needed to grow. All I ever said to him was a harsh, let's go Dawes or Olympian time. Let's do this, Lionheart, was all it took. With Guns N' Roses blaring in the background, the air was tense and filled with aggression, determination and pure intensity and desire to win. Slaying the dragon. Now, Dorian had something he always did when he was spotting you. <laughs> he always said, at some point near the end of the set, three more reps. Now you never knew when he was gonna say those words and you often prayed to hear those words as your body started giving up, your quads were tearing down, breaking down, but he always knew when you had three reps left. After eight reps, my quads were finished. That last eighth rep was all I had and the last few inches felt like forever to come up, but then it came. Three more reps, lad. Holy shit. I thought I was done. How on earth was I going to get another three more reps? But three reps I got. From somewhere deep inside, you find a place. It's almost a mystical, spiritual place where your body goes to in the event of a life or death situation to make sure you'll live. It always keeps something in reserve. This is what Yates brought out in you and what I eventually learned to bring out in others. It's a place where your mind, body and soul come together. Perhaps if you are religious, you may have an explanation for such a place. I'm just beginning to understand about these things, but after all these years, there is great power and truth in learning such things and experiencing them is the only way 
in which you can truly learn them. I'll always remember three more reps for as long as I live. Those words remind me of what I always have still to give, no matter how tired I am, no matter how hard or long I've been working or training or writing, there's always three more reps. I once described the places to a friend when I was trying to describe what it was like training with Dorian back then. I said it was truly like a mythological experience from the annals of Greek mythology. I know that sound, may sound crazy, but hear me out. It's like you're walking over to a precipice. The precipice over a cliff edge. And the cliff edge is the precipice over into hell. You lean over and you feel the heat from the fame, the flames and the fires of hell beneath you. And there he is, the devil himself. And you laugh, you laugh at him. You laugh because you know he's never gonna defeat you. You laugh and then you pull up, you pull back, back into the land of the living and you have survived. You've survived the battle with the dragon of your life. And that same mentality you learn there is the same lesson that the Greek myths teach us, that you can overcome anything if you give everything you have to a cause. But it has to be everything. And by commitment, I mean giving your all, every last ounce of life you have. With that level of desire, there is no battle that you won't win. As we all completed our sets, Dorian would take a mouthful of water, swill it around his mouth and spit it out all over the floor of the gym. I don't think I've ever seen him drink any water. I don't think he or we could have swallowed anything and kept it down. Seriously. If you're drinking any type of shake or drinking liters of water through your workout and you're not being sick, you're not training hard enough. I was too respectful to his gym and to him to ever spit my water out over his floor. But I sipped a little bit of water just to keep my mouth from getting too dry. I once asked a fellow pro bodybuilder who often joined us for workouts at Temple, the great British pro Gary Sheldermine, about Dorian spitting his water out. And he laughed and he said that he too, he saw it, but he never did it either as he was too respectful of Dorian and the gym even though we both felt we wanted to swell our mouths out. Anyway, we had a good laugh about that. Two exercises in, and I was just about finished. My quads were shaking, walking was a bit haphazard and wobbly, but we still had one more exercise for quads and hamstrings and calves to do. Last up for quads were hack squats. Dorian was immensely strong on these, and they were brutal. Only one warm-up set needed, which maybe wasn't even necessary for the muscle, but was more for the setting up of the mind-muscle connection. For the body to know what was going to be required of it. After you do an exercise a thousand times, that movement becomes embedded in your brain. Each time you do the exercise, every time you do a rep, a new neurological fiber is created. So that when you do your warm-up set, you're really telling your body and your brain, okay, this is what's coming up. This is what we're about to do. Get ready. That last set of hack squats were insane. Every inch of energy, every fiber of your quads were straining and firing to get the weight moving down to the bottom and up again to the top. Arse the grass, back up again, just short of lockout. The last few reps on these were like torture. By now we were screaming with pain and effort. With the music blaring out, it was a surreal environment. Anyone looking in from the outside world in would have thought there was a war going on. I guess in reality there was. It was a war. I've never seen anything like it and I've never seen anything similar to it ever, ever again. I can say hand on heart, I've never witnessed anyone train as intensely as those sessions back then. I'm sure there are. I'm sure people do train like it. It's just I've never witnessed it myself ever again. And until I do, I'll keep looking forward to that day. I long to see it. Anyway, 
Then we took a breather, short breather, two or three minutes before we did hamstrings. Now, it wasn't long, it was just enough to clear the stars from your eyes and to try and get your breathing back to somewhat near normal and not gasping for air as we had been doing just a few minutes earlier. Now, hamstrings was a fresh body part. Even though we'd used them as a secondary muscle during our quads, we gave the first exercise two warm-up sets before we went all out in our working set. Hamstring curls was the first movement, a steady controlled negative followed by an explosive concentric part of the rep with a big squeeze at the top of the movement. As your hamstrings reach the top and you peaked, you squeeze the heck out of it. The two warm-up sets were followed by a heavy working set. All out maximum poundage for 10 to 12 reps with one or two force reps at the end when your hamstrings were cramping and failing. An important point to remember, whether you're training with Mr. Olympia or just with your regular training partner, is to get rid of your ego. Leave it at the door or be even better still, take control over it such as the Stoics teach us to do. If you do this one thing, you are likely to stop making simple basic mistakes most people make when they train. Even some top pros make these mistakes. They can't learn this one thing. They'll either suffer an injury or they'll stop growing. Anyway, next up was stiff leg deadness. And as the name suggests, these are done with stiff-legged, not straight-legged. Those two are very different exercises. And I would always recommend stiff-legged deadlifts over straight-legged, as they are safer, especially when you are lifting 140, 150 kilos. Only one warm-up set, and then straight in with our maximum poundage, which was around 140 kilos, or three plates aside, plus a biscuit, if possible. Now, biscuits, that's what we called them, were the tiny 2.5 or 5 kilo plates we had, which we added when we were trying to improve our strength. Instead of putting on a 10 kilo each side, which is too big an increase to see gains with. So we would always go with a small 2.5 or a 5 kilo increase over our last weight that we could get 12 to 15 reps with. Now, last up for hamstrings was single leg curls, standing at the time until Dorian bought a great hammer strength machine where you knelt with one leg and killed with the other and then reversed the movement to isolate the other hamstring. But back then we had a standing single leg machine where we could isolate each hamstring individually. Last up was calves. By then our bodies were almost finished. Our central nervous was shattered. They must have been hammered as if we'd been in a war zone and we could hardly walk to the, to the standing calf race. Sometimes Dorian would only do standing calf races, as his calves were so strong anyway. But mine were weak, so I was always glad to do one working exercise on standing and seated calf race. The standing calf race at Temple Gym was legendary. I believe there were only two ever made, and someone told me a while ago that one of them is still in use at a gym in northern England somewhere. Well, I must find out where that is and pay it a visit sometime. <laughs> it was an awesome bit of kit. The weight stack was enormous. The heaviest weight stack on a calf raise I've ever seen. And it had two arms at, at the top where you could add extra plates if needed. And he needed them. I didn't. <laughs> Dorian's calves were crazy sick doing these. It looked like someone had stuffed a football down his sock as his calves raised up to the top and then down to the stretch at the bottom. It was insane. Now, my calves had always been my weakest body part. I, do, I tried everything to make them grow, and genetically, I have weak muscle insertions in my calves, allowing little potential for growth. But with that machine and Dorian and Kenny's assistance, I managed to get my calves up to a point where they were in symmetry with the rest of my body. Now, my legs were a strong point at the time, so it was important to have them in symmetry with my quads and my hamstrings. It's almost ironic now, being disabled, my leg, 
my legs were almost withered away whereas they had been pretty much the first body part people noticed on me and luckily I was always pretty symmetrical and noted for my shape and my condition uh, sadly not for my size in an era when I was competing with behemoths and dinosaurs <laughs> to die only to become resurrected at the end of the workout was when we finally dropped the chairs or to the floor <laughs> as I did often where Dorian would just walk over me I think taking great pleasure but in a friendly way telling me to stop making the place look untidy the battle with the dragon had been won and now we could relax and chat again these are moments where true camaraderie can be built and friendships and respect is earned and remains true for a lifetime. I haven't messaged Dorian for some time, but every now and then I send him a message asking him how he is and how his life is in Spain. And he usually makes a remark about me living in sunny Scotland. <laughs> I did invite him and Gal over one time, but he said sadly, Gal can't stand Birmingham's weather, so there was no way he was going to persuade her to come to Scotland. <laughs> Sad, really, as I think she'd really love the mountains, the glens and the lochs up here. There's no better country on earth when the sun is shining up here, that's for sure. And so, I returned. After a drink and a good chat, I would slowly and very carefully climb those same steps back up to the land of the living back to the world where I had vanished from some hours earlier to undertake my own quest into Hades to defeat one of the dragons in my life the dragons never go away challenges will always accompany you in life no matter what you do or how hard you try to avoid them you can certainly live with standards morals integrity and ethics to minimize your dragons but life is rarely fair and is often brutal without having experienced so many dragons in my life with each training session that I put myself through I think I prepared myself for what challenges lay ahead for me in life with my accident work nourishes noble minds said Seneca a long long time ago and so should you work and nourish your mind and so should you work make your mind noble and allow yourself to aim towards the person that philosophy or God or whatever you believe in wish to make you now until next week remember there's always three more reps in you reaffirm remain firm you who suffer don't be kidnapped by your impressions the struggle is great the task divine to gain mastery freedom happiness and tranquility Epictetus discourses till next week goodbye <laughs>